Good evening, everybody. <laughs> All right, let's uh, stand and turn to page 389. I am resolved no longer to linger, charmed by the world's delight. Let's sing unto the Lord as we stand, page 389. I am resolved no longer to linger, charmed by the world's delight. Things that are higher, things that are nobler, these have alert my sight. I will hasten to him, hasten so glad and free. Jesus, greatest sun all the month of April. So this is day number two. And I said, I'll take it. All righty. Well, let's take a look at our
for his commitment with promise. And fathers, provoke not your children to wrath, but bring them up in nurture and admonition of the Lord. So for this week, we're supposed to learn the verses that deal with the servants and the masters. Um, verses 5 to 9. So 5, 6, 7, and 8 talk about the servant's relationship to the master. And then verse 9, the master to the servant. Uh, but he starts off verse 9 by saying, Ye masters, do the same things unto them, which takes into account everything that he has just said in the previous four verses. So it's not like he's, he's addressing just the servants or addressing the servants more than the masters, but he starts off with the, mas the servants, and then he tells the masters, you do the same things. Everything I just said, I'm not going to repeat myself, but it all applies to you as well. Uh, and then he makes that application there, all right? So let's say those verses together. Matthew, or yeah, Matthew, Ephesians 6, 5 to 9. Servants, obey them that are your masters according to the flesh, with fear and trembling, in singleness of heart, as unto Christ. Not with eye service as men pleasers, but as the servants of Christ, doing the will of God from the heart. With goodwill, doing service as unto the Lord and not unto men, knowing that whatsoever good thing any man doeth, the same shall he receive of the Lord, whether he be bond or free. And ye masters, do the same things to them, forbearing threatenings, that knowing that your master also is in heaven, and there is no respect of persons with him. All right, now we move on to the armor of God. We'll do this in two weeks. So we'll break it up, verses 10, 10 to 13. Um, he it introduces us to the armor of God, talking about the spiritual warfare, really, is what he's going to introduce here. Be strong in the Lord, and the power of his might put on the whole armor of God, that he may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. And that's a little bit different in verse 13. Wherefore, take you the armor of God, that ye may be able to withstand in the evil day, and having done all to stand. So verses 11 and 13 are very similar but the wording is slightly different. In between there, verse 12 talks about the spiritual forces that we wrestle against. All right, as believers, we are in a spiritual warfare. While many of the New Testament Christians were in a fight for their lives back in those days, I mean, it was a life or death struggle because of the persecution. Paul reminded them that even though their lives were at stake, that was not the real nature of the battle. The real battle was spiritual. Uh, and of course, that is the battle that we have today as well. You cannot win the battle in the power and energy of the flesh. You have to, to fight this warfare in the power and energy of the Holy Spirit. We need the armor of God. All right, ushers, if you'll come then at this time for our Wednesday night offering. <laughs> and let's go to Lord in prayer tonight. Uh, Brother Jones, would you pray for the offering, please? Let's stand one more time and turn to page 386, page 386, all for Jesus, all for Jesus. Stand as we sing, page 386.
Mike, if you can go ahead and turn on the projector, we'll use that this evening. We may have to do something where we have everybody bring a friend on, on Wednesday night. So look around, see who's not here. You've got plenty to pick from. And on Sunday, invite somebody to come out for opening night of missions conference. So find somebody that's not here and say, hey, we need you to come out Wednesday night. You don't want to miss it. If you wait till Sunday, they've missed half the conference, over half the conference if you count the banquet as well. So I want to encourage them to, to be here next week, and you can help with that as well. Turn your Bibles to Exodus chapter 15. Exodus chapter 15. Last week, we looked at the matter of the Passover and the Exodus. The children of Israel, after 400 years in bondage and bitter slavery, God had brought them finally out of Egypt. They had endured 10 horrific plagues. The first couple, they had to actually go through before God made a difference between the land of Egypt and the land of Goshen where the children of Israel were, but they went through a couple of them. But even the ones they didn't necessarily go through, they experienced them certainly uh, as they saw the effects they had upon the Egyptian, and especially the last one, the plague of the death of the firstborn. Uh, the nation of Israel was commanded to take the blood, to set aside the Passover lamb, to slay the Passover lamb on the 14th day, to take the blood and strike the doorpost and the lintel and, and the blood at the basin. And if they did that, the death angel would pass over. But if they didn't, the, the firstborn would still pass away in their house. So they had to obey. There had to be the element of faith. But you can imagine, you know, the thoughts going through their mind as they hear the cries from the Egyptians, will, will the blood work? You know, will it, really, will it really keep God at bay? I'm sure they were, you know, if I was the firstborn, I'm the middle child, so <laughs> I had nothing to worry about. But, you know, if you were the oldest son and you were in the house, you're probably thinking, Dad, will that, putting the blood there, is that really going to work? And he said, well, God said it would. We just have to trust God. Uh, but when your life's on the line, sometimes it's a little bit challenging to trust the Lord. But God brought them through that, and then Mo Pharaoh said, get out of the land. And so they spoiled the Egyptians, and they left. What a time of great rejoicing it was. But then they soon came to the Red Sea, and Pharaoh pursued after them. And then they cried out again to Moses, what are we going to do? Was it because there wasn't enough graves in Egypt that you brought us out here to be slain by Pharaoh's armies? And so God told Moses just to hold up his rod. God parts the sea. The people go through on dry land. The Egyptians pursue after him, and God brings the waters back together and drowns the Egyptian army. The nation of Israel is finally free of the Egyptians, and they can't wait to get to the promised land. But God's got some work he's got to do on this nation, and so he's going to take them through a time in the wilderness. Now, initially, the plan was going to, to go for about two years, but two years in, they rebelled against God, and God judged them that they would spend another 38 in the wilderness for a total of 40 years before they would reach the promised land. And all those of that generation that were in unbelief died in the wilderness. Uh, but the next generation that came up after them that were born in the wilderness, God took them into the promised land. So tonight we're going to look at what happened in regards to the golden calf and how we reached that point so shortly after such a great victory in leaving the land of Egypt. So let's pray. Father, we thank thee again for the time and thy word tonight as we come to this story about the golden calf. I pray that you'll use it to speak to our own hearts, uh, that we would be careful not to be so quick to turn away from the things of the Lord. Uh, having come through this pandemic, uh, we know that many churches are struggling with attendance, that a lot of people have turned away from God. They've gotten out of the habit of going to church. They've lost interest in the church. Uh, they really lost interest in the Lord. They're not obeying God. They're not living for God. They're not serving God. Um, they're, they're just content to go through life as is. And Father, I pray that you would bring a wake-up call to the churches in America, to the believers in America, that we would see the importance of being faithful, that we would see the importance of taking the gospel to the lost. We pray for our missions conference that you'll stir the hearts of our own people to be faithful, uh, that they might come and that you might speak to the heart about this matter of missions and taking the gospel around the world. Uh, just guide, direct, and bless in the lesson this evening. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, after the crossing the Red Sea, the children of Israel, first thing, you got a large group of people as they did, the multitude that's traveling, the most important thing they're going to need is water. And so they come to Marah. Look in chapter 15, verses 23 and 24 of Exodus. Verse 23, it says, And when they came to Marah, 
They could not drink of the waters of Mara, for they were bitter. Therefore the name of it was called Mara. And the people murmured against Moses, saying, What shall we drink? <clears throat> Mara means bitter. You may remember the account in the book of Ruth of Naomi. She had left during a time of famine. Her and her husband Elimelech went over to the land of Moab. Her two sons, Kilian and Malan, both married Moabite women. Her husband and both of her sons died. And so Naomi returns back to the land of Israel. Ruth, her one daughter-in-law, accompanied hers. And when she returns to her homeland, the people say, Is this Naomi? And she says, Call me not Naomi, but call me Mara, for I am bitter in spirit. Mara speaks of bitterness. And so the water was bitter. So God told Moses, he says, you cut down a tree and throw the tree in the water and it will turn the water sweet. Now, I don't know how that works, but it did. God said, you do this and it'll solve the problem. And so God cured the waters. They were able to drink of them. And then they traveled on and they came to Elam. Elam was, I mean, if you were going to camp in the wilderness, Elam is where you were going to want to camp out. Look at verse 27. It says, and they came to Elam where there were 12 wells of water and three score and 10, 40 palm trees, and they encamped there by the waters. You know, when you talk about desert wanderings or in the wilderness, 12 wells of water and 40 palm trees, that's as tropical as it's going to get. I mean, this was the, in, if you read through scripture, this was probably the, the nicest place Israel got to stay in the 40 years of wandering in the wilderness. I mean, this, there was plenty of water. Uh, you know, there were trees. It was just a nice place to camp. And so, so they were there, but God didn't leave them there long. He then brings them to the, into the wilderness of sin, S-I-N. In chapter number 16, verses 2 and 3, the Bible tells us, And the whole congregation of the children of Israel murmured against Moses and Aaron in the wilderness. And the children of Israel said unto them, Would to God that we had died by the hand of the Lord in the land of Egypt, where we sat by the flesh pots, and when we did eat bread to the full. For ye have brought us forth into this wilderness to kill this whole assembly with hunger. So now they're not complaining about water, but they're complaining about the lack of food. And so God's going to provide manna. Manna was a bread from heaven. That when they went out in the morning, it laid upon the ground, and they would go out and gather it. And God, every morning, they had to gather enough bread for that day. If they tried to keep it for the next day, it would breed worms and it would stink. So they had to, if they, if they picked up extra, it, it would go bad by the morning. It was, they had to every day do it, except on the day before the Sabbath. Then they could gather two days, because on the Sabbath day, God said there won't be any. He said, they, because you're not allowed to, to work on the Sabbath, you're not going to gather it up. You're just going to stay in your tents and rest. I'll give you extra manna on the sixth day so you don't have to gather it on the seventh. Well, some of the people didn't listen, and they went out on the seventh day to find it and couldn't find any. Uh, they Maybe they were the ones that had tried to gather extra before, and it had stunk, and so they figured it would do the same thing this time. But God told them that if they listened, they would obey. But they, the manna wasn't enough. They wanted meat as well, and so God said, I'll send you quail. And I was like, how are you going to send enough quail to feed this multitude of people? But God did it. The people fell upon the quail and they lusted after the meat and they, they ate it and God smote them with a great plague because of the lust that they had in devouring the quail. So they depart from the wilderness of sin and they come to Rephidim in chapter 17, verse number 1. And all the congregation of the children of Israel journeyed from the wilderness of sin after their journeyings according to the commandment of the Lord and they pitched in Rephidim and there was no water for the people to drink. So here, again, they're without water. This time, God tells Moses, I want you to strike the rock, and the rock will bring forth water. So, God, so Moses takes his rod, he gathers the people together, he smites the rock, and the water comes forth. Now, this is the first time they bring forth water from the rock, not to be confused with the later event where God told him to speak to the rock, and Moses didn't listen. We won't get to that tonight, um, but that is a later event. This is the first time when the rock was to be smitten, and Moses obeyed, and the water came forth. Well, while they're in Rephidim, the Amalekites battle with them. In verse number 8, it says, Then Amalek fought with Israel in Rephidim. And you remember the account here, Moses sent Joshua out to fight. This is the first of warfare that they will face. Now, they've been in bondage for 400 years. They've never fought any battles in terms of an army. This is their first organized conflict as far as an army is concerned. And Joshua is the leader. Moses went up on the hill to watch the battle with the rod of God. And you remember the account that when he held up the rod, the Israelites were victorious. But when he brought his hands down, then the Amalekites became victorious. And so Aaron and Hur, who were with Moses, they had him sit on a rock. And Aaron held up one hand and Hur held up the other. And, 
And they kept it there until the sun went down and God gave a great victory. And then he told Moses, you write this for an, in, a, in a book as a memorial and rehearse it in the ears of Joshua so that he'll remember what I did here against the Amalekites at Rephidim. Chapter number 18, Moses re, is reunited with his family. Verse number 2, then Jethro, Moses' father-in-law, took Zipporah, Moses' wife, after he had sent her back. Uh, somewhere along the line, Moses' wife and sons had returned to her father for a time. Uh, and now that they have left Egypt and are traveling the wilderness, Zipporah and the boys are brought back to be with Moses. And then in chapter 19, we arrive at Mount Sinai. Now here is where God is going to give them the Mosaic law. In chapter 19, verse 1, In the third month, when the children of Israel had gone forth out of the land of Egypt, the same day came they to the wilderness of Sinai. So they've been on the road, or they've been... <laughs> They've been walking through the wilderness, I guess you could say, for three months. And they now arrive at Sinai. And this is the mountain of God where God is going to give them the Ten Commandments. He's going to give Moses all the law. And so God begins to instruct Moses, and Moses begins to instruct the people. The first thing we see here in terms of what's going to happen here at Mount Sinai is the failure of the people. Notice the timing. Israel entered into a covenant with God. And right after they enter into a covenant, they are quick to turn away. Look in Exodus chapter 24. Come over a few pages. Exodus chapter 24 as we make our way through the scriptures here. Beginning in verse 3, And Moses came and told the people all the words of the Lord and all the judgments. And all the people answered with one voice and said, All the words which the Lord hath said we will do. And Moses wrote all the words of the Lord and rose up early in the morning and built an altar under the, under the hill and 12 pillars according to the 12 tribes of Israel. Now Moses has not yet gone up into the mountain to receive the Ten Commandments, but he ha God has already given him by the Ten Commandments back in chapter 20. The Lord spake all these words unto Moses, saying, I am the Lord thy God, which brought thee out of the land of Egypt, out of the land of the house of bondage, and thou shalt have no other gods before me. And he goes down through the Ten Commandments. So God gave them first orally to Moses, and Moses shared them with the people. And then Moses wrote down the law in a book. Uh, he wrote, wrote down all the words of the Lord, verse 4 tells us. Uh, and he presented that to the people. And the people then entered into a covenant, in verse number 7. And he took the book of the covenant, and he read in the audience of the people. And they said, all that the Lord hath said, we will do and be obedient. And Moses took the blood and sprinkled it on the people and said, Behold the blood of the covenant which the Lord hath made with you concerning all these words. And so God, Moses brings the children of Israel to enter into a covenant with the Lord. He writes the word of God into a book, the book of the covenant. He takes the blood and he sprinkles it upon the people as a sign of the covenant. And the people agree, we will do what God said. We will obey God's word. Moses then goes up into the mount. He's going to be gone for 40 days and 40 nights. Now, he did not leave the nation of Israel leaderless. He had left Aaron and Hur to watch over the people and to provide whatever leadership was needed. They weren't going to be going anywhere. The camp wasn't moving during the time that Moses was gone. But he was going to be gone briefly. 40 days is basically... A month is 30 days, a month and 10 days, a little over five and a half weeks. It took them three months to get there, so maybe we're five and a half months or a little further down the road than that, that they've been in the wilderness. But Moses has been gone for 40 days, and the people conclude he's not coming back. We don't know what happened to Moses, but he's not coming back. They become restless. They say, who's going to lead us? They apparently didn't trust Aaron and her. Uh, they, they, Moses is the only one they were willing to listen to. Now, they were stubborn, rebellious people, as we're going to see. So they complained, and they, they decided, well, let, we need to do something. We need to do something. So they came to Aaron and to her, and they said, we don't know what happened to Moses, so we want you to make us gods to lead us. Look in chapter 32, beginning in verse number 1. Come over to chapter 32, verse number 1. And when the people saw that Moses delayed to come down out of the mount, the people gathered themselves together unto Aaron and said unto him, Up, make us gods which shall go before us. For as for this Moses, the man that brought us up out of the land of Egypt, we wot not what has become of him. Now notice the problem right here in this verse. 
Who did the people say brought them out of Egypt? Moses. As for, for, as for this Moses, the man that brought us up. Moses didn't bring them out of the land of Egypt. God did. See, they had already gotten their eyes off God, and they were looking to man. And, and if you look to man and man's not there, what do you do now? now? You have to look to the Lord. So Aaron comes up with a plan in verse 2. Aaron said unto them, Break off all the golden earrings which are in the ears of your wives and of your sons. Now, I'm not sure why their sons had earrings, but uh, it was an indication of the direction they had gone as a nation. And of your daughters, and bring them unto me. And all the people break off their golden earrings which are in their ears and brought them unto Aaron. And he received them at their hand and fashioned it with a graving tool. That's important. And after he had made it a molten calf, and they said, These be thy gods, O Israel, which brought thee up out of the land of Egypt. And when Aaron saw it, he built an altar before it. And Aaron made proclamation and said, Tomorrow is a feast to the Lord. We're going to have a great feast tomorrow to the Lord. So we come to the leader's involvement. The Bible doesn't tell us anything about her. Uh, apparently he wasn't involved in this, or they looked at Aaron as Moses' brother as the leader in Moses' stead. But Moses, or Aaron, played a part in this. All right? He fashioned it with, a, with his hand. All right? He took a graving tool and he made a molten calf. So Aaron ha had a significant role in this. And we'll find out later that, that when he was confronted about it, he came up with a story to explain what had happened. But we'll come to that in a minute. All right, so we see the leadership involved, and then we see the sins of the people. What did the people do? Well, the first thing they did was they committed adultery. Idolatry, I mean. They committed idolatry. Where did they learn idol worship? In the land of Egypt. Okay, Egypt was, was a land known for all of its idols. Uh, they had learned that from them. Uh, apparently, the golden calf was significant because it was repeated generations later. Keep a finger in Exodus and turn for a moment to 1 Kings chapter 12. We'll come right back to Exodus, but 1 Kings chapter 12. After Solomon's son Rehoboam came to power, God divided the kingdom because of Solomon's sin. And the northern ten tribes he gave to Jeroboam. And Rehoboam, the son of Solomon, had just two tribes, Judah and Benjamin. Chapter 12, verse 26. And Jeroboam said in his heart, Now shall the kingdom return to the house of David, if this people go up to do sacrifice in the house of the Lord at Jerusalem. Then shall the heart of the people turn again unto their Lord, even unto Rehoboam, king of Judah, and they shall kill me and go again to Rehoboam, king of Judah. The problem Jeroboam had was these ten tribes that he was now in control of were still supposed to go to Jerusalem to worship, but Jerusalem was in Judah. It was in the southern kingdom. He said, if my people go down there every year for all the feasts, eventually they're going to return to Rehoboam. So I've got to come up with something to keep them from going down there, to keep them here in the land. So verse 28, whereupon the king took counsel and he made two calves of gold and said unto them, it is too much for you to go to Jerusalem. Behold thy gods, O Israel, which brought thee up out of the land of Egypt. And he set the one in Bethel and the other he put in Dan. So here we go generations later. After David has served as king and after Solomon, they built the great temple and all that God had blessed Israel with. Jeroboam comes in and the first thing he does is he takes them back to idol worship, particularly the worship of a golden calf. But instead of one, he makes two of them because Israel's now scattered out. And so he makes two, one in Dan, one in, where did I say it was, Beersheba? Uh, so that they're going to go and they're going to worship those idols at those locations instead of going down to Jerusalem. Well, is idolatry something that we have to be concerned with today? And of course, the answer is yes. Now, there are many religions that still worship literal idols. Uh, you know, Buddhism and uh, Hinduism and, and a number of foreign uh, Eastern religions still have idol worship. Even Catholicism involves idol worship. They wouldn't call it that, but they're basically bowing down to statues and kissing statues and, and all the rosary and the different things that they do. That It's a form of idolatry. And while 
in American Christendom, we don't necessarily get involved in idol, idol worship and such as gods of wood and stone, yet we have a problem with what we call idols of the heart. See, an idol is anything that we place in our life that takes a place of God. Anything can become an idol. Your money can become an idol. Your job can become an idol. Family can become an idol. Athletics or academics can become an idol. Hobbies, recreation, entertainment. Uh, anything that keeps me from worshiping God as I ought can be an idol in my life. It's an idol that I set up in my heart. And so we have to guard against idolatry, worshiping or putting something in the place of God on the throne of our heart, something that we are unwilling to give up or something that, that we are unwilling to surrender to the Lord. So the people committed idolatry, and we see that so often today in people's hearts. They, oh, they, wanna, they, they, wanna, they don't want to go to hell. They want to be saved, but yet they're not willing to give up the idols of their heart, the things of this world. We see here that they combined false worship with true worship. Aaron, in making the golden calf, he proclaimed a feast day unto the Lord. He says, now we're going to have a feast tomorrow to the Lord God Jehovah, and we're going to worship here at this golden calf. Well, that doesn't work. You can't worship God and idols at the same time. God had just told them back in chapter 20, thou shalt have no other gods before me. Moses had written in a book, thou shalt make no graven image or bow down any graven image. He had, he had just written all that and the people had agreed to it in a covenant that was sealed by blood. And yet, here we are. Mixing idolatry with the worship of God. Cain had tried it. He brought to God his, his offering, the first fruits of the ground, but it was not what God required. We see it as well today, the combining of false worship with true worship. You think about ecumenicalism. Ecumenicalism is the idea of, of those of different faiths coming together to work together in ministry. Now, there's nothing wrong with combining and working together in ministry, provided that you all believe the same thing. So as a church, when we're involved in things, we are always involved with churches of like faith. So we had the Mid-State Choir the other week, and that was with churches of like faith. I had Bible quizzing this Saturday. That's when, with churches of like faith. But when your local ministerium gets together and the Catholics and the, and the Lutherans and the Methodists and the Episcopalians and everybody's all there and they want us as Baptists to come in and join them and work together, we have to say we can't because they don't believe what we believe. They don't believe the truth of the Word of God, that salvation is by faith in Christ and Christ alone. And so we end up mixing false with that which is true. You think about the matter of entertainment, the use of uh, the world's music and the world's methods or the world's programs to attract the world. Uh, there's been a push uh, in recent years to use different, you can use anything you want to get people in and then once you get in there, give them the gospel. You want to have a rock concert and the people will come out to that, that's great, and then give them the gospel and get them saved. So uh, that type of mentality says you can use anything you want to get them there as long as you give them the gospel when you get them there. But the Bible doesn't teach that either. Okay, because you're taking, you can't use the things of the world to bring people to Christ. Because if they come to Christ, they're assuming that the, the Christ they're coming to accepts everything they just did. Everything that you did to bring them in, if, if you use that to bring them in, they're going to say, well, you know, the, the church was doing that the night I got saved. There's nothing wrong with that. There'll be no separation. Not only did the people commit idolatry, not only were they combining false worship with true worship, but they... It involved immorality as well. Uh, in verse number 6, the Bible says, And they rose up early on the morrow, when Aaron had declared his feast, they rose up early on the morrow and offered burnt offerings and brought peace offerings, and the people sat down to eat and to drink and rose up to play. That word play in the Hebrew speaks or has an immoral connotation, speaks of immorality. And again, just keep a finger in Exodus. Come over to 1 Corinthians chapter 10, over to the New Testament. 1 Corinthians chapter 10. Paul, in writing to the church of Corinth, he's going to refer back to some of the things that happened in the Old Testament. In 1 Corinthians chapter 10, beginning verse 1, he says, Moreover, brethren, I would not that ye should be ignorant how that all our fathers were under the cloud, and all passed through the sea, speaking of the Red Sea, and were all baptized unto Moses in the cloud and in the sea, and did all eat the same spiritual meat, 
and did all drink the same spiritual drink, for they drank of that spiritual rock that followed them, and that rock was Christ. But with many of them, God was not well pleased, for they were overthrown in the wilderness. Now these things were our examples to the intent that we should not lust after evil things as they also lusted. Neither be ye idolaters as were some of them. As it is written, the people sat down to eat and to drink and rose up to play. That's right, right out of Exodus chapter 32, verse 6. Neither let us commit fornication as some of them committed and fell in one day three and twenty thousand. Now that's talking about another event that happened in the Old Testament. Neither let us tempt Christ, as some of them also tempted and were destroyed of the serpents. That was another judgment that God sent, the serpents, when he put the brazen serpent on the pole. Neither murmur ye, as some of them also murmured and were destroyed of the destroyer. Now all these things happened unto them for in samples, and they are written for our admonition upon whom the ends of the world are come. Wherefore, let him that thinketh he standeth take heed, lest he fall. And so over in the book of Corinthians there, he talked about what they went through, and he mentioned in that one verse the matter of immorality. Now come back to Exodus chapter 32 and down at verse 25. And when Moses saw that the people were naked, for Aaron had made them naked under their shame among their enemies. So this, this, when they rose up to play, <laughs> it was a very wicked, ungodly, immoral situation that was taking place. And they had stripped themselves of their clothes and they were naked and there was a lot of immorality that was accompanying the idolatry. And so it is that idolatry and immorality often go hand in hand. Well, God tells Moses, Moses, there's a problem in the camp. The people have rebelled. You need to go down and you need to get things squared away. Look at chapter 32, back to verse number 11. And Moses besought the Lord his God. Well, let me back up here to verse 9. And the Lord said unto Moses, I have seen this people. And behold, it is a stiff-necked people. Now, therefore, let me alone that th my wrath may wax hot against them, and that I may consume them, and I will make of thee a great nation. In verse number 7, the Lord had told Moses, Get thee down, for the people which thou brought us out of the land of Egypt have corrupted themselves. Yeah, God says, Moses, you need to get down there. Your people have gone astray. The Lord said, they're stiff-necked. He goes, let me alone that my wrath may wax hot against you. He goes, I'll destroy them all and start over with you. So Moses, he appeals to the Lord for restoration. He could have said, Lord, I've had it with these people. Go ahead and wipe them out. Let's start over. But he didn't. He fell on his face before God and he appealed to God. His, his appeal was threefold. Verse 11, And Moses besought the Lord his God and said, Lord, why doth thy wrath wax hot against thy people, which thou brought forth out of the land of Egypt with great power and with a mighty hand? See, back in verse number 7, God said, Moses, your people that you brought out of Egypt have corrupted themselves. And Moses got before God and said, No, Lord, your people that you brought out of Egypt have corrupted themselves. These are your people, Lord. They were God's people. God was linked to his people. Not only is God linked to his people, but his name is also linked with them. Look at verse number 12. Wherefore should the Egyptians speak and say, For mischief did he bring them out to slay them in the mountains and to consume them from the face of the earth? Turn from thy fear thrust and repent of this evil against thy people. He says, Look, you brought them out by the name of Jehovah, the great I am. You were their God. You brought them out. If you brought them out and then you destroy them, what will the Egyptians say? What will that say about you as a God? That you weren't able to take care of them, to provide for them. And then he reminded God of his promises. Verse 13, he says, Remember Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, thy servants, to whom thou swearest by thine own self, and saidest unto them, I will multiply your seed as the stars of heaven. And all this land that I have spoken of will I give unto your seed, and they shall inherit it forever. Moses said, Lord, you made a promise to Abraham, a covenant. It's a matter of your character. Can you be trusted to keep your word? 
So Moses appeals to God. He says, God, you are linked to these people. These are your people, your name. They're called by your name. They're called by Jehovah. Your promises and your covenants are all connected to them. And if you don't keep your word, it's, it, it's a reflection of, a, of your character. So the next verse tells us that God repented of the evil. Verse number 14, And the Lord repented of the evil which he thought to do to his people. So God repented. Now the Hebrew word for repent means to sigh, to pity, or console. It does not mean that God was sorry for wanting to destroy them or that he had changed his mind. What it does mean is that God had pity or compassion and acted in response to Moses' prayer. Everything that God does, he does in answer to prayer. So what does it mean when it says that he, when you read a passage of scripture that appears to say that God is changing? Well, there's a couple of explanations. One, it could be that God's actions and emotions are simply being described in terms of human terms. A lot of times you read about the hand of the Lord. Well, God doesn't have a body. He's a spirit. He doesn't have a hand like you and I have. We call them anthropomorphisms. And it basically uses the, the picture of something that we can identify with to explain what God is doing. Uh, it could be that he, it's a different stage of God's plan. In the Old Testament, God was working with the nation of Israel. In the New Testament, he's working primarily with the church. After the church is raptured, God will again be working with the nation of Israel during the tribulation period as the 144,000 Jews are saved. And so it could be that God's at a different stage in working out his plan. Or it could be that man's conduct has changed. And so God is responding based upon what man has done. When we, when we, do, when we repent of our sin, God repents of the judgment against us. Think of Jonah. God said, I want you to go and preach to the Ninevites. And Jonah said, I'm not going to do it. Why? Because if I go and I preach and they repent, you won't destroy them. And he goes, I want you to destroy them. So, of course, you know the account of Jonah. And eventually Jonah went and he preached and they repented. From the king on down in sackcloth and ashes. And God, God did not destroy him. And Jonah said, see, I told you this is what was going to happen. But if you come to the book of Nahum, you find out in the history of Nineveh that later they returned to their sin and God did send judgment and destroyed them as he said that he would. God doesn't change. His love is constant. His attitude towards sin is constant. He will not compromise. When we grow apart from God, it's not God that has moved, it's us that has moved. We are the ones who need to change and return to the Lord. And so Moses is going to confront the people, and I'm, going to, I'm running a little behind here tonight, but bear with me, we'll get to our prayer time in just a moment. Moses comes down from off the mountain to confront the people. Now along the way, he comes upon Joshua. Joshua had gone up with Moses into the mount, but he was not with Moses up on the top of the mount. Moses was alone when God gave him the Ten Commandments. As he comes down, he meets up with Joshua, who for the last 40 days has been halfway up the mountain all by himself, just as Moses was with God up on top of the mountain. Chapter 32, verse 7 and 8, the Bible tells us, And the Lord said unto Moses, Get thee down, for thy people which thou brought us out of the land of Egypt have corrupted themselves. They have turned quickly and gone out of the way. That's not the verses that I want. But anyway, so he, Moses comes down. He comes across Joshua. How about 17 and 18? They're the verses that I want. 17 and 18. And when Joshua heard the noise of the people, as they shouted, he said unto Moses, there's a noise of war in the camp. So here's Joshua. He has no idea what's happening in the camp. God told Moses what was happening, but Joshua wasn't there to hear that. So Joshua didn't know what God had told Moses. Joshua's not in the camp, so he doesn't know what's happening. He wasn't with Moses. He didn't hear what God told him. So Joshua's in the middle. Moses comes down, meets with Joshua. They start down, and Joshua says, man, it sounds like there's a war going on down there. <laughs> Verse number 18, Moses says, it is not the voice of them that shout for mastery, neither it is the voice of them that cry for being overcome, but the noise of them that sing do I hear. Moses said, no, Joshua, there's not a war. What's taking place down there is sin, immorality, idolatry. The people are, are partying, if you will, in a modern terminology. They've turned against God. So Moses comes down. He confronts the people with their sin. By the way, the world's music fits the idolatry and the immorality 
and it has no place for worship in the house of God. You know, what, it, what was taking place in the nation of Israel at that time, the, the immorality, the idolatry, wasn't something that was acceptable to God. And the music that accompanied it would not be acceptable to God as well. You know, you can't bring the world's music into the church and expect it to work. It just doesn't fit the nature and character of God. So he shows them their sin. How does he do that? First, he, he breaks the tablets of stone. In verse number 19, And it came to pass, as soon as he came nigh into the camp, that he saw the calf and the dancing. And Moses' anger waxed hot, and he cast the tables out of his hands and break them beneath the mount. God never rebuked Moses for doing that, because even though he was angry, he was not responding in anger, but rather he was showing the people that they had broken God's law. In the New Testament, James said, Whosoever offendeth in one point is guilty of all. If you break one point of the law, you've broken the whole law. And so Moses, symbolically, he breaks the two tables of stone that had the Ten Commandments on and demonstrating to the people that they have disobeyed God and they have broken his law. He then destroys the offensive object. In verse number 20, he takes that golden calf and he grinds it up in a powder and pours it into water and makes him drink it. And then he turns to Aaron. He says, Aaron, what did these people do to you that caused you to lead them into sin? Verse 21, And Moses said unto Aaron, What did this people unto thee, that thou hast brought so great a sin upon them? And Aaron said, Wait a minute, Moses, Moses, Moses. Let not thine anger of my Lord wax hot. You, thou knowest the people, they're set on mischief. For they said unto me, Make us gods which shall go before us. For as for this man, Moses, that brought us up out of the land of Egypt, we, we what not, we know not what has become of him. And I said unto them, Whosoever hath any gold, let them break it off. So they gave it me. And I cast it into the fire, and there came out this calf. Now wait a minute. <laughs> we already know that he fashioned it with a graving tool. He didn't just throw it into the fire and out popped the calf. All right? Didn't he think Moses would know better than that? And when Moses saw that the people were naked, we already read that verse, for Aaron had made them naked for their shame among the enemies. Then Moses stood in the gate of the camp and said, Who is on the Lord's side? Let him come unto me. And all the sons of Levi gathered themselves together unto him. So Moses he says, Aaron, what did you do? And he says, well, you know the people. If you come over to the book of Deuteronomy, you'll find that God had every intention of slaying Aaron, but Moses interceded for him. Moses prayed for him, and God spared his life because Moses prayed for him. But then ex judgment was executed upon the people. Verse 26, Moses called them. The Levites come over. Verse 27, he said unto them, Thus saith the Lord God of Israel, Put every man his sword by his side, and go in and out from the gate to gate throughout the camp. And slay every man his brother, and every man his companion, and every man his neighbor. And the children of Levi did according to the word of Moses. And there fell of the people that day 3,000 men. 3,000 men died as a result of the sin. Now, in comparison to the numbers that were going to die in the future, this was just a small group of people. Over in Corinthians, it said when they fell into immorality, over 23,000 died. All right, so there's going to be occasions where many, many more thousands are going to die than this particular one. But this was the first event where they had disobeyed God and God sent judgment and many of the people died. And then finally we end up, the people repented. Chapter 33, verse 4. And when the people heard these evil tidings, they mourned and no man did put on his ornaments. For the Lord had said unto Moses, saying to the children of Israel, Ye are a stiff-necked people, and I will come up in the midst of thee in a moment and consume thee. Therefore now put off thy ornaments from thee that I may know what to do with thee. And the children of Israel stripped themselves of their ornaments by Mount Horeb. God told Moses, you tell the people that they have disobeyed, that they have sinned, and that I'm going to come up and destroy them. And when he did, the people mourned and repented, and they stripped themselves of the ornaments and all that, they had, all that was associated with the immorality and the idolatry. And God repented of the evil that he had thought to do unto them. In answer to Moses' prayer, he spared the people. This is just one example of the many that will occur over the next 38 plus years. As the nation of Israel wander in the wilderness, they will repeatedly murmur, complain, rebel against God, and God will bring judgment until that generation is completely destroyed. Only Joshua and Caleb 
that that generation would enter into the promised land. But even after they enter the promised land, you come to the times of the judges. In the times of the judges, you repeatedly see and the children of Israel would walk with God. They'd rebel against God. God would send, a judge, send an enemy who would oppress them. God would send a judge to deliver them. The people would repent. Things would go well for a while. Then they would sin and God would send an enemy to oppress them. And the cycle just goes on and on. Well, unfortunately, the cycle happens in our lives as well. Oh, not from nations oppressing us. But how often do we find ourselves oppressed by Satan? We fall into sin. We, we cry out to God for forgiveness, and God forgives us, and we, we restore that relationship to God, and we, we, boy, we're doing really well spiritually, and then circumstances of life come upon us. We get distracted, discouraged, defeated. We get away from God. And God has to get our attention. We fall into sin and God has to bring judgment into our lives. And the people, we find the process repeating itself over and over. But you know what? God never tires of forgiving his people. If we, no matter how many times you've repented before, if you continue to repent, God will continue to forgive. That's the God we serve. He loves us beyond our human comprehension. Peter asked Jesus, how many times should we forgive? Seven times? Jesus said, no, Peter. Seventy times seven. Not that he was giving him a number. He was saying, you, you, you just keep on forgiving. And that's what God does for us. He keeps on forgiving. So if we'll confess our sins to him, he's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Father, we thank thee for the time in thy word tonight. I know I took a little bit longer with this lesson. But Father, how often do we find ourselves in sin away from God. We allow the things of the world, the things of this life to come between us and our God. But we're so thankful that when we cry out that you are quick to hear and to forgive and to cleanse us. Uh, Father, that's not an excuse to sin. Paul said, what then? If grace should abound, should, can we go on in sin? He says, God forbid. So help us, Father, to live a life that is pleasing in thy sight. And Father, when we do fail, help us to come and seek repentance and restoration that we might go on in spiritual things. Help us not to quit or to faint or to give up until Jesus comes again. In thy name we pray. Amen. All right. Well, for our prayer.